Chapter 7 Summers were an endless nightmare. I suffered while awake. Nights were filled with broken dreams that woke me more times than not to fits of crying. Once, only once, my mother came to me. What are you doing up? She squinted at me through sleep. I had a nightmare, I said. Your arms were cut off and Dad was trying to take us, take us kids and run from you. You tried to keep up, you fell in the parking lot, but you had no arms to break your fall. There was blood everywhere. Shut up and go to sleep, she snarled, slapping my light off, and went back to bed. I sobbed alone in the dark. I often had nightmares of my mom. I must have seen her killed 100 times. When I woke, I cried into my pillow. I would sneak into her room while she slept and stand over her where I cried. She never woke up. I was careful to never wake her again and didn't. I would touch her to make sure she still breathed, finish my cry, then go back to bed. When September returned, I eagerly ran back to school. School met no Sean, well, less Sean. At school, I was safe. I had a Hosea and things to help occupy my mind from everything happening at home. On the first day of high school, seventh grade, my English teacher worked well to relax us and lighten our nerves. She was kooky and zany and eccentric, and that day, she'd brought in her CD player. She was exercising a fair amount of silliness when she exclaimed, Oh, I just got my new soundtrack. So excited. She pressed play and posed like she was singing an opera. What is it? A student asked. The Phantom of the Opera, she said. Have you heard it? A head nod. Have you heard it? She asked another student. A head nod. Have you heard it? She asked me. And I shook my head. I'd never heard of it, let alone heard it. She crossed the classroom and slipped the headphones over my ears. Oh, the sound. Music zapped my soul to life. The violins flowed, their melodies plunged through me, and awakened my cold, deadened heart, killed by the fear and hate that I had once to know. Notes from the cellos warmed me and pushed my blood to my heart. The oboes, flutes, and clarinets breathed a life into me like the gods breathed life into man. I found the rhythm in my heart obeyed. The streams pulled and played with me like a marionette, and I danced and bent to their will. The music called, and I followed. I descended and I fell with each diminuendo, and when the music rebounded in a crescendo, it carried me with it, high above the timpani, the cymbals, and the, it was gone. I fell back into the classroom. Idle chatter came back to me, and I gasped, desperate for the sound to revive me once again. My teacher had returned her headphones to her own ears, and I hung there mid-orgasm, unfulfilled, unsated, needing something I couldn't possibly get anywhere else. What was that? I asked, swallowing back another gasp. The Phantom of the Opera, she said. I did what only I knew how. I went to the library, located Gaston Leroux's The Phantom of the Opera, and read my very first real book. If ever there was a day that changed me, it would be that day. The words of Leroux pulled me in like nothing I had ever known. I slipped into his world with such ease. Within moments I was there on the steps of the opera house. I was there in the dressing rooms and at the lake touch and burn my fingers on the candles. It was a macabre Beauty and the Beast set to music. My sweet, my dearest, my life, my love, the bane of my existence. My music, sweet music that gave me air to breathe, strength to stand and the will to try. My music that, within that moment, became the very essence of my existence. As I poured over the words of LaRue, I found a music there, a rhythm of its own. The book ended too soon, and when I closed the final page of that first book, those three precious words moved me with such feeling. I was too stunned to cry. Eric is dead. To the books I ran, to the books to learn everything there ever was to learn. From LaRue, I learned of Paris and Marc Chagall. I wasted no time returning to my encyclopedia set, for I had claimed them as my own, and I learned, I learned of musicals and operas, and wherever the Phantom of the Opera was, Les Miserables was sure to follow. Back to the library, I found Victor Hugo, Les Miserables, was nearly 1,500 pages. I was only allowed to take a book out for three weeks. There was no way I could finish Les Miserables in three weeks. When I was just shy of 14, I approached my father. Dad? Hmm. I want a book. I don't know how or why we were ever in that bookstore that day. We didn't go into bookstores. I think my mother wanted to look up something. It was two days before my 14th birthday. Screw selfishness, I was going to do it. I held the book to my chest, cradling it as if it were my firstborn child. Dad, please may I have this book? He sighed and stared at the book like I was holding a pile of shit. 
I don't know. It's a book. It's my birthday. Can you count it as a birthday present, please? You don't have to give me anything else. Just, just this, please. He made a face that confirmed he thought Victor Hugo was a waste of money. Please, Dad. Please, you, you can skip my Christmas. I don't care. I want this book. At the end, after an hour of begging and negotiations, an hour of holding the book to my heart, unsure if I would be leaving it behind, my father consented, and I had Les Miserables. The Irish rains picked up outside until the sharp plinks of droplets punctuated the silence. William stared in silence, watching. I need a Guinness, I said. I pushed myself up from the table and glanced out the window. I watched the rain strike the glass. The earthen gloom that enveloped the land confirmed that the sun had started to set beyond the black cloud cover. I flipped on the kitchen light and grabbed a beer out of the case resting on the floor. You want anything? I asked. I have Guinness, Smittix, Harp. I can do a whiskey if you have it. I gazed at him in question. He didn't look like a man who could hold down his whiskey. Please, he added. I have Jameson, Blackbush. Jameson, neat. I grabbed the bottle of Jameson from the top of the fridge, an opener from the drawer, and a glass. Help yourself, I said quietly, and passed him the glass and the bottle. I opened the Guinness and poured the thick beer down my throat, taking in the sweet drink. If Ireland had a flavor, it would be Guinness. Liquid Ireland. I'd taken piano when I was four, I said. I played until I was five, then quit when frustration set in because my five-year-old hands could stretch the octave. At twelve, as soon as I heard the music, I asked to return to piano lessons. My mother played. There was no question. It was the only luxury I was allowed. I picked up right where I left off with a passion that allowed me to escape into the rhythmic realm of music. I took up chorus that year as well and began vocal lessons through the school. I wasted no time composing and writing melodies and compositions. I had more staff paper than anything else and it was all over my room splayed out around my cats on the floor and tucked into every crevice. Over the next eight years, music was the frequency I rode on to carry me through my darkest days. I gulped down another three mouthfuls and rolled the beer around in my mouth while I fought back images. So many memories in my mind. I rubbed the bottle on my brow. Too much was coming back to me. Too much. I was remembering. I saw the darkness. I saw the room. The shadows. The figures shaped like wraiths. I watched William sip the whiskey. I gazed out the window and stared into the Irish hills. I knew what was to come.